Hey, Gabriel Blake. Hey, Gabriel Jose. Where are we today? Today, I'm in San Francisco on my couch. All right. And today, I'm in Chicago in my chair, seeing how it is still snowing. Do you have a corgi yet? Because my puppy is right here. Uh, so when I get a corgi, are you going to be like bringing your dachshunds so they can play together? Absolutely. And if you get a female corgi, they can be dog parents. <laughs> that would be weird. That would be like pretty weird, like a dachshund corgi mix. That's strange. My mom has a pit bull puppy that she got about the same time I got my puppy, and my puppy is a boy and very interested in her pit bull puppy. And I've been trying to convince her to let them have their own kids. And then I met a pit bull dachshund mix on the street in San Francisco, and it was the cutest thing I'd ever seen. Oh, yeah, that sounds adorable. No, I'm checking. I'm checking the mixes of both corgis and dachshunds. They're weird. They're not good. <laughs> There's no good, man. It's not good. Uh, it's better to just keep them apart. Uh, so, what did we watch this time? We watched the 2005 Michael Haneke film, French film, um, Cachet, starring Juliette Binoche, and that's the only actor I can name from memory, uh, <laughs> which came out in 2005, I said that. Yeah, it came out in 2005. Yeah, I didn't know like any of the other ones. Juliette Binoche, I think that from the first program, the season on the screen is like, that looks like Juliette Binoche. Oh yeah, it's not Juliette Binoche. And she was actually, she did another film with Hanukkah called 71 Fragments of a Chronology of Chance that won, I think I could be wrong, but I think it won the Palme d'Or at Cannes. Wow. Okay. No, I never watched that one. He's like one of the pending ones that I have. I still have like a couple of of poems that I need to watch from Hanukkah. You know. Uh, and this was our pick. We pick it, well, say what we pick. We picked because a couple episodes ago we watched David Lynch's Lost Highway and it felt like there were a lot of uh, uh, similarities, I guess, or... Common topics. Common topics, common plot devices. Um, and so we just kind of percolated on that idea and decided to watch it again because we like to punish ourselves with Michael Haneke. Well, I would say that it's like usually I wouldn't have chosen, even like we discuss it when we we're talking about like Lost Highway and we say like, nah, let's not watch this. But then we watch Flea. And for me, it's like, now I'm ready. Now I'm ready. After this, is that I need something that is a bit more harsh in my life. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you felt that way because I always welcome the chance to be asked to watch the <laughs> suffer. <laughs> to suffer. Uh, and as this was your pick back to back to, uh, to, uh, to flee, I guess that I had to summarize it. Uh, this one has a bit more of, I don't know, like a story, let's say. Basically follows like the life of these uh, French men. They live in Paris in a nice house. And he's uh, the show, the, show, the presentator, like the driver. The host. Of the host. Literary, literary like, show. analysis. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's like a middle high class i would say like high class probably and he lives in this small house with uh, his wife julia Vinos. what does he do for a living again is this an editorial no a publicist it was for a publisher i couldn't tell if because he mentions that she released the book and i didn't know if she released it as the author or as the publisher i think that is publisher i think that is publisher because it also like just works with her boss you know that it's like friends with the family, blah blah blah, um, and they have a kid, like regular teenager kids, like what 12, 13 years old. And don't know, remember if they actually mentioned that. And one day they receive a weird video that it lasts a long while, uh, and it's like recording like the facade of the house you know from the street is like from some half a block away like just recording that and we see how the father and the mother they actually leave the house um nothing else just that was that first video delivered with a drawing nothing it was like just a bag a plastic bag with a video and there is no indication about like who sent it or anything and they start receiving like more videos on the following videos that they receive as you were mentioning is that they start receiving like drawings of something and at that point when we see like the first 
drawing there is like a kiss like just bleeding through their nose or mouth the uh, father starts remembering something they're like just photograms not photograms like the big juicy dick from a fight club but a bit more of a okay he's remembering something that he had forgotten or actually just buried in his mind um, until the story starts unraveling uh, and we discover spoiler alert I mean there is like more the videos start like changing after receiving a couple of things about like the uh, front side of the house they start like just sewing pieces that they can be connected to him directly so he started investigating a bit more and he started remembering that there was like another kid in the family that it was like the song of song Afghans too Lebanese, Lebanese. But no, 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 they were Algerian. Algerian, yeah. They were Algerian and, uh, and they were like just uh, working hands for the farm that the father used to live in when he was little. You know, that the like parents. So... His parents yeah, were clearly high saying. class. He may be upper middle class, but probably high class. Probably high class, yeah. He lives in the house in, uh, in Paris, is that he's high class. And uh, so. He started remembering that the parents, it was like they died in some kind of revolts because it looked like Paris was like super racist. So it's, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then the family thought about keeping the kid, about adopting him. And uh, the father, sort of like George, just like that. I think that is the name. Just Logan, when he was a kid, he was like pretty jealous of that and he made up some kind of lie about it for them like to take it away um so he ends up reconnecting with the kid that the kid was Majir Majir was the name of the kid now as a grown up uh and he promises that he is not the one sending the videos blah 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 then there is like this moment where his teenager kid disappears briefly they don't know exactly where he is so they call the police on them and the police of course arrest them and they treat them like brutally you know they treat Majid and his son brutally and they spend like the night at jail uh, then Majid calls him again to his house he tells him I'm not the one I'm really sorry about the videos I'm not the one sending them and he commits suicide in front of them in a very I, yeah, in a very similar way to other movies of Haneke let's just leave it at that yeah he invites Georgia George to his house George, yeah and he's like what did you want to talk about and then he's like I just wanted you to be here for this and he kills himself yeah. in a particularly brutal way yeah and I saw it like the uh cover of the movie that is like the blood stain that is like a red thing is that that's actually the blood stain in the wall that we see after my like a suicide I have to say that's a killer movie poster or DVD yeah. cover that's awesome yeah 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 it's like pretty like okay, what is this and what you see is like oh my god because like it's brutal in the kind of way that Hanukkah likes to do things about it. and not like making it like Hollywood brutal it's like it's like too close to reality for feeling comfortable seeing this we always bring up this word when we speak about Hanukkah, but it's just so clinical. There's no music telling you how to feel. There's no nope. like dramatics. Nobody has these insane reactions. It's just like, <laughs> hey, we're gonna watch this dude slit his throat. Yeah, well, I mean, there is like an insane reaction because the guy actually just like touch him a bit, you know, like with his feet, I think, and then he actually runs away and he goes to the cinema. Well, they are playing the bad education, but I'm all over. Oh, with Guy Garcia God. Bernal, yeah. I didn't notice that actually. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's that's pretty insane. So instead of calling the police like right away, you go to the cinema. Cool, nice. Uh, so and at it's that almost point... like he has no plans to go to the police. His wife is like, uh, people are gonna think you murdered him. You yeah. need to tell the police what happened. Because the first time that he has recognized with Majid is that they he didn't know that he was being recorded. So, and Majid lives with his song, so that leaves us that the only person that he could have recorded all of this is the song. Yes. I mean, they never reveal who it is, but logically, if it's not Majid, it's the song. Yeah, and then there is like a some conflict with the song that he goes to visit him at work and he tries to face him. Uh, and for closing, instead of having some kind of resolution, is what we have is like this a scene with Majid's song and Georgie's song, where they talk in a mostly friendly kind of way. There is not like a fight or anything, but that makes us think that 
they knew each other and some kind of ways like some of the comments from the kid that they were a bit weird like when he started like getting angry at the mother because he thinks that she's having an affair is that like, I had a feeling that it may come from him and it's interesting because that final scene which takes place on the steps of a school it in my opinion the framing insinuates it's being recorded oh you're right um and so my thought and there's no definitive answers here like there's uh, michael hannah purposely didn't want to give you any sort of satisfaction of knowing what happened um he never does that's going to be the next video that's sent to george to horrify him that's good. Yeah, I didn't thought that it was like one more layer. No, 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 that's cool. That's cool. I didn't think about that. Um, I just thought that it was a bit more of Haneke, as always, like liking to slap like people about like, I'm not going to be like giving you any kind of closure at this. And that's a very interesting thing. The first time when you see the first video, it's like five minutes of just the front of the house and nothing happens until Julia Binoz or uh, Daniela Otelli is a they say something and you think it's like, oh, they're talking about like recording. It's like, it takes like a second to just like things make sense. And they are like multiple times when they start a scene with a recording, but you don't know if it's reality or it's a recording. And it plays a lot with that. Because as you mentioned, how George starts to have what we're guessing are memories, but they're as the story unwinds, they're unreliable memories. So it calls into question, like, what of this is reality and what is not in terms, like, Michael Haneke purposely won't even let us know what actually happened on his parents' estate. Like, it's like, did this happen? Did it not? Yeah, because even, like, when they're, like, displaying how they kill the chicken, you know, and the kid goes with the axe, it's like, as we, they never identify, like, which kid is who. Yeah, and that's what I got confused when we were talking about this in The Lost Highway. I thought it was the murder of the pig, which happened. That's Benny's video. I can, yeah, I confused it with the, like, killing the cop. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The roster, the roster. Um, I mean, it's true that at the end, when they, spoiler alert, we're spoiling all of this, is that when they take Majid away, like the orphan state, they made, made away, you could actually say, oh, that was Majid. <laughs> he was not churches. So I can go back and now just put in perspective who was who. And uh, I think that when they're like talking at each other, Maj Georgie says like, hey, what could have done? You were like just a bigger and a stronger than me. And that's it. They never go into detail exactly on what he did. It's like he only recognized at the end to Julia Binoche about like, I just accused him of doing something that he didn't do. And he he was like, obviously- Speed and blood. But he wasn't honest with Anne, Julia Binoche's character at all. At all. And, and so we know that both his memories and he are unreliable. It's like, I think something way worse happened on that farm that no one wants to talk about, but... I don't think that it was like anything worse, you know? I think that there's a bit more of a commentary around France about like how they treat like just immigrants. And I think, so he gets, he's interested in that idea and he develops it even further. Um, in fact, his last movie was very specifically about the Syrian, as I recall, they were Syrian, but more immigrants coming and ruining a high-class party that Isabelle Pair throws. Um, so it, it's interesting just to see this kind of like this seed of an idea and he starts to explore it through the context of basically horrible people. Well, in this case, they're not actually horrible. It's actually kind of gray how in the wrong George was because he was also a kid. He's not, you know, kids act out and do stupid things. He couldn't have known it was going to affect him that much. I mean, I think that he's not subtle. Like, Hennig is not subtle on this movie because if you remember, like, that is scene when they are leaving the police station and he starts screaming at the black guy that is on the bike. He's a... Yeah. He gets portrayed as an asshole, you know, it's pretty, they're like small occurrences, but then how he lies to his wife, how he treats Majin, how he threatens him, is like, this guy is worse. This guy is a bit more of the rottenness. I think there's a bit more of the underlying rottenness that Haneke likes to play with. 
about like oh you only see that it's like a super culture guy that is like just hosting like this program is that like, actually he's pretty fucking racist you know and i think that is exactly what they're trying to portray about like oh maybe the french society is a bit like that it's like we're going to be like just from outdoors we're going to be like yeah of course it's like we're an open-minded society just come here but then it's like in the point that we don't feel comfortable with you we're going to be like this posse of you and how nothing has changed from today versus was it the 1960s where that revolt happened 60s yeah i think so yeah 60 something uh it's just more subtle today in my yeah. opinion that's what yeah you and i felt i i honestly felt it's like usually haneke is a bit more of a humanity is humanity is terrible about like we're always going to be like doing a very bad thing given the chance and on this one it just felt like okay there is a bit more of a message it's not like so general you know it's not like the white ribbon for example that is like well this could happen and then you're screwed uh or funny games that is like you cannot run away or something a situation like this you are at the mercy of just random cruelty that it can happen like at any point in this one i just felt it's like no you are trying to tell me something about like the french society here it's interesting um because he's not french obviously um he's austrian so but more than half of his movies are in france oh yeah yeah no. oh really Is i think so i don't remember no that's austrian but is it the piano teacher amor this one 71 fragments uh the seven continents that was Austrian, no well the, that was either in germany or austria but there's barely any speaking so <laughs> well only when they get like all the money <laughs> you know when they <laughs> sell all the money that's the only thing um so you have seen this before yeah we both watched it most recently 10-ish years ago a bit less, but yeah. Um, what did you think? Uh, it impressed me a bit less, you know, than the previous time. I mean, but that's the thing is that you already know that the other guy is going to be the comedian suicide in front of them. So Benny's video horrorized me way more than this movie, which were way more horrific, you know, about like how terrible, you know, like characters and on the movie like what kind of atrocious things they do in this one the kind of atrocious things that they do they're a bit more subtle in the other in the other movies they feel a bit more about like the nature of the characters and on this one they feel a bit more of a combination of the nature and the circumstances that it has like less weight you know i'm not saying that anyone is innocent here but I'm just saying that it's like, oh, it looks like the circumstances are pushing them over something. When the other one is, like, for example, I'm more, yeah, it's the circumstances, but that thing is actually terrible. What happened? It's about yeah. like, we want to see like something like breaking apart. And on this case, now maybe it's because of the point that they're trying to make. It's like, at this case, a bit more is like, hey, at the end of the day, what happened here? My gene committed suicide, but the family is still like happily together. As far as we know. Well, the white people always win, I think. Is... <laughs> Correct. It's what I'm saying. Is that there is a bit more of a larger message. And I'm not saying that it's I want to bad. say that that was not my opinion. I'm saying that's what I think the film was trying to say. I just want oh, to yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. I mean, the, the show is like pretty open about that. About like, hey, this guy like lost his father. He tries to face this guy. Did something change? nothing at all is that this guy now is going to have this kid is going to have like a terrible life ahead when he already was having it so it's not that it's better or worse i just felt different you know in haneke feels i feel more hopelessness and in this one i i felt hopelessness but it's not like the same level of intensity that i was expecting i agree with all of that and i think it's the like if you look at the films he did leading up to cache by the way i i said that 71 fragments got a ton of accolades i was confusing it with code unknown which also stars julia Binoche. sorry um but there's like funny games code unknown 
piano teacher, Time of the Wolf. And these are very much like he's judging all of humanity. Yep. And so this is the first film, at least that I'm aware of, that he introduces. It's not like explicit politics, but it is politics. They're refugees coming to a place and that place is eating them up. Like, so yeah, I, that deviation from that just overall judgment from Michael Haneke that we are a terrible species, um, it feels different and it is way more subtle. And yeah. I agree with you that it impressed me less yeah. this time. Although I think it's an incredibly solid film. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that it's bad. It's more like yeah. when I go to Haneke, I'm expecting to tell me that like, it doesn't matter that you're living in the States, in Spain, in Germany. Is like we are all shit. That's it. Yep. So just enjoy, enjoy the terrible nihilistic trip that we have ahead. You know that you may just die in very like terrible circumstances because something completely random. Because we are all garbage. And on this one, I just felt is that like, you know France is a yeah, I do. Is that they're terrible? Is it? I thought that we were all terrible. Why do we have to focus <laughs> that, on just a single country? Something about like him pointing fingers at all of us feels better than pointing a finger at a specific section of society. That makes me uncomfortable for some reason. I don't know. I mean, it's not that it makes me uncomfortable. It just makes me like you're not usual. <laughs> He's not a director for just like making. You said politics, but it's like. He's more maximalistic with his topics. And this one, I just had the feeling that it's more like self-contained about like the topic that he's portraying. Is it still like just people being terrible? True. But it's more like self-contained about like what is like the aftertaste that it actually leaves. So it's interesting because as I mentioned, his la the last film he did, Happy End, also takes on politics and it also wasn't brutal enough for me. Like yeah. when I go, uh, just like you, I I want to be shocked. Like I, this is horrible to say; it's an exaggeration, but I want to feel like kicked in my stomach when I go see a Michael Haneke film and a gasp yeah. breath and try and get my breath back. Um, Did you? There is something that I want to mention here, you know, because I I think that you mentioned it, like briefly about like we don't know what is true and what is false, you know, like about like what is actually happening and what is actually recording until they start like rewinding or they start like just talking on top of it. And I just thought about it is like he really likes like the uses of VHS and just rewinding and stuff because Benny's video is about that. And funny games, he has like this thing about like just wait, well, this doesn't happen. Uh, and here you have like the idea of I display reality, but it's not reality. Which is, again, similar to Lost Highway. Like, both David Lynch and Hanukkah had this fascination of, like... What is reality, what is not? Like, Bill Pullman specifically says at the beginning of Lost Highway that he hates camcorders because he doesn't want to know what really happened. He only wants to remember what he yeah. remembers happened. And there's yeah. something they're both playing with. Um, and it makes me kind of bummed because when you watch a David Lynch film, one of his lesser films next to a Michael Haneke film, you're like, whoa, there are people that make way better films. <laughs> Sorry, when you was what? I think I didn't follow. Just that like watching David Lynch in, like we said, a new sort of idea for him. So it was kind of amateurish. And then to watch a Michael Haneke film, and I would argue Michael Haneke is one of the very best directors working today. Well, I don't know if he's working today, but in the last 20 years. Yeah, but I would also say that David Lynch is one of the best directors like working today. Who? David Lynch. Yeah, I can't deny that. I clearly remember telling you, telling you that the Twin Peaks new season was the, my favorite thing he's ever done. <laughs> yeah, so it's, like, it's not that he's like, oh, you know, he's, he just already like just climbs, you know, and now it's like just the aftertaste. I know he's still good but for some weird reason he doesn't want to do more stuff he only wants to do like random songs for netflix so whatever um Music. <laughs> exactly and weather reports on youtube uh but i don't disagree the only thing is that they have like different styles and they have like different ways of just approaching both of them they have a topic in common that is like i would love to see an interview with both of them because both of them they like to use menace as an element of their films is that yeah, you always know yeah you always know that things are going to get 
bad. And you're always going to see, and also like just looking about, like just trying to dissect society from the perspective that everything looks perfect. And it's like, well, when you start like just pulling from the threads, it's like things start getting grim and getting weird. They get weirder for David Lynch and they get like more directly violent and terrible for Haneke. But they both try to, uh, David Lynch is not so much about humanity is terrible. Haneke has like a point that he wants to make. He wants to just kick you in the groin. That's true. And David Lynch is like, I just want to do something crazy. Yep, I agree. I agree. And I'm trying to think of another word because I would never call David Lynch camp ever. But if you were to compare Lost Highway to this film, they're exploring a lot of the same ideas, but he's just willing to have a mystery man that's bald and do freaky things on screen instead of like Michael Haneke, who's like, we're not going to give you that satisfaction because the mystery man doesn't exist except inside all of us. Exactly. We are the mystery man. But the funny thing is that the mystery man in David Lynch movie in uh, in Lost oh. Highway is also him. It's like everything is him, you know? So there is not so much. It's a bit more that Haneke... Oh, God. David Lynch. You know who remembers me too? To Charles Kaufman. How so? Tell me. He's not afraid of actually getting into the mind of the characters and doing something completely freaking insane. Adaptation, man. Yep. Or, you know, like even uh, I'm thinking of ending things and just compare it with this. It's about like, okay, it's like all of this for this. That's amazing. But wow. Uh, so, from that perspective, I think that Haneke is more of a descendant or a disciple of maybe more of the cinema verite, but in a very cruel kind of way. You know, about like the closer that I'm to reality, the better. I Even you see, like, like, what? I wonder what his childhood was like. I don't, I don't want to know. Man. <laughs> I'm just afraid <laughs> because I'm pretty sure that he could make a movie out of that too. Uh, but if you actually look at the camera that they use, I don't know if on the on the version that you watch it happened that, but it felt almost like soap opera. You know, like this kind of is like, okay, this is like way too real. Like they had camera that they were using around the house. Like following the family. Now I want to go back and rewatch some of the scenes. Yeah, he was definitely, in my opinion, he was playing with the audience and trying to be like, when is this a hidden camera? And when is this just the story? What's going on? I just think that it's like if it was a fixed camera, it's like it's true that it's like it could have been a recording because the only time that he's moving is like when he's going on the car for so he's like, this is where he lives. Yeah. So uh I like it. I don't think that there is anything like brown per se. It's more that I was like really afraid. It's like, we're going to the Haneke universe again. I'm going to be desolated, you know, as I was with Funny Games, as I was with Amor, you know, or with the White Ribbon. And I felt like, eh, okay. At some point, I'm going to make you watch um, Time of the Wolf just because it's the film he did between The Piano Teacher and Cache. And clearly he's pivoting a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So it, I just, I think it would be an interesting conversation to have with you. You got that. Okay. Uh, should we go for the questions? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, pa -pa -pa -pa. So we just watched Cache. Sorry, I just like blank out for a second as I didn't prepare like the form beforehand. Uh, would you watch it again? Yes, I own this on DVD. That's how long <laughs> I've owned this movie. I will watch it again at some point. I mean, to be completely frank, you used to have like a gigantic DVD collection. It's true. And you want to hear something sad? After I purged the vast majority of my DVDs, um, notes on a scandal stayed. <laughs> you chose poorly. I did. I really did. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I will watch it again, you know, like probably not tomorrow, but it's not, you know, sometimes when we watch like a Haneke film, it's like, oh, I need like three years for coming down from this. And it's like, no, I mean, I wouldn't watch it tomorrow because I remember like the whole thing, but in two months, three months, so why not? Yeah. Yep. Uh, would you recommend it? Yeah, I would. I am at a point that is like, I, I would almost recommend this to my parents because I don't think that is that terrible or that like soul crossing as some other it's not a comedy but it's no. not as soul crossing as many other of Hanukkah films I would never recommend Venice video to anyone <laughs> to I no would one. 
maybe this isn't right, but I would say this is one of the most approachable Michael Haneke films. And it's interesting that we're... Yeah, and we are using approachable in the context of a movie that involves someone like committing suicide, like just staring at the camera. But at least we don't watch a family get tortured playing funny games for two hours. I mean, it's it's there's a that's spectrum. True. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> okay, that's true. Uh, do you think that this is more or less approachable than the uh, piano teacher? Um, I, I don't even know if that's like a serious question. Do you remember the piano teacher? <laughs> I do, I do, and it's like Isabel Hooper does an amazing job. You know, like how. The derangement. Remember when she goes into the glory hole adult booth and she pulls out the covered tissue and she sniffs it while masturbating and then she goes to have dinner with her mother and she slits the inside of her thigh so it looks like she has her period? I'm sorry, you can't even compare the piano That's teacher. true. I, I have forgotten like those details. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I would recommend it. Definitely. Uh, would you remember it? Um, I remember the major plot points from 10 years ago. So yes, there were large portions that I had forgotten, but not, this is not a forgettable film. I remembered it. Yeah. I even remember like the videos, like knowing that it was about him, knowing that he would go to see someone that it was from childhood, from his childhood. And I remember like the ending. I remember like the unsatisfactory ending about like, I want resolution. And Haneke tell me you are not getting it. It doesn't matter because it was not about the resolution. <laughs> well, because the thing is that the point was not like the resolution or not. Is that the, the the point was like just making a commentary, like a social commentary, and it's like just telling you that it's like maybe the point of that thing is about like hey, we know that this guy was racist, like inherently racist, as we saw like in multiple scenes. Even he was trying to pretend like this culture elevated guy. Is like, Maybe there is more hope for the next generation while these two are actually just talking together, or maybe they're going to be like repeating the story. Who knows? I desperately need him to make at least one more film before he dies. I need it. I need one more statement from him <laughs> to figure out what I think about the world. <laughs> that's, that's fair. Uh, is there anything artistic about it? Yeah, I think... Um... I was actually admiring the way he uses pacing, which is funny because we were just talking. I was talking about pacing issues, I felt like, with Flea. Um, I just admire his ability to make me look at an image for a really long time and for it not to take away from pacing or the film or how compelling I find it. Like, he just makes you sit with what he wants you to sit with, and I'm happy to do it. And I think that's incredibly artistic. Yeah, no, I agree. Because the first three minutes, I was like a bit terrified about like, oh God, I have forgotten that they were like really long recorded scenes. And then it was like, no, as there is this kind of impeding tragedy, is that you want to see more, is that you don't care, is that you have like this kind of a stalker mentality when you're seeing that scenes, but at the same time, like morbid curiosity around it about like something is about to happen i can feel it you know like the impeding explosion you know i, it actually, I like the foyer and like when you realize that um that george and Anne are actually watching this on a screen you see it from both the perspective of whoever the fuck was doing this recording which is creepy as hell and you feel invaded as george and Anne, and like you just i don't know it's incredible. yeah yeah, 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 no, it actually is masterfully done. It's like from someone that didn't have like the patience with Tarkovsky and those five minutes of driving, you know, is like, I can say that like, I just put up with these five minutes at the beginning and I thought that it's like, that was good. When they actually rewind and everything clicks, it's like, well done. Well done, Haneke. And you are going to be like playing with the same resource like three or four times and still well done. About like just not knowing if it's right, if it's wrong. Is a and especially because you think it is when they are like just leaving, is that you're expecting them to look towards like the point where the camera was the first time that they didn't realize about it. And they don't do it. So it's like you don't know if it's there or if it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So is a, I think that that's it's interesting, but I think that that would be like the biggest artistic concept on this about like just making art or a fixed camera and making us like put up with those five minutes yeah um is it a timeless piece yes 
I mean, there's some there's some technology that kind of dates it a little bit, but it's not like germane to what the story is about and what. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I agree. I don't think there are like some historical concepts, but at the end, it's not about that. It's a bit more about like this violation of privacy, this kind of feeling of being observed. And at the same time, like just having to revisit like your past because maybe you did like a really big mistake that you didn't give any kind of importance to it without thinking about the ramifications in the future. Yep. So that's universal and timeless. Uh, could you turn this into a TV show? I don't think so. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't think Michael Haneke would want to give away any more of the story than he already did. That's the point, like we said. Um, no, I like it as a movie. Mm. I don't think that there is any way of turning this into a TV show. Honestly, it's like, I, what are you going to do? Like, sending more videos? That works well, but imagine a TV show that starts every episode with five minutes of a big <laughs> camera. That's kind of a cool plot device. Like, each episode would start with the newest video that got sent. I, yeah, I, I don't see it, dude. Is that that's a gimmick that people is not going to have like interest about that? And you're going to be like just fast forwarding, you know, because you already know that that's a video. And the thing is, like, here you don't, you are not sure if it's a video or not. Yeah, I mean, it would have to be shorter, more digestible for TV. It'd be like, oh, now we see George's parents' house. What will this episode mm -hmm. be about? Uh, I don't know, man. I, I just feel like. No, my answer is moving. definitely. Okay. No. okay, okay. Right. Yeah, I, I feel like Haneke's movies, they're like such an explosion, such a slap to the face, that if you actually just spread it over time, it's going to be like just losing steam. I think that I could also translate well. Uh, do you think that this movie could have been better? No, I hesitate even like trying to... No, no, I can't. No, 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 no. I, I, no, I'm curious, I'm curious because I... I debated a bit, you know, because we hesitated when we we're talking about like the movie about like this is not exactly what Haneke does, but it's not in a, the surface level. It's a bit more on the deep message level. Why these differ from other movies, you know? Yep. But I don't think that that makes it better or worse. It just makes it a different movie. Yeah. Agreed. I don't think it makes it a worse movie. It's just not the emotional cutting movie that we like so much from him. Yeah. So for me, the answer is no. I don't think that this could have been better without like changing it into a completely different movie. Yeah, mine is no as well. Yeah. Uh, so something that I forgot on the previous podcast to ask you before we actually uh, rate this. Um, it was uh, try to remember, you know, like one of the previous movies, like just give me like the general, the general kind of, you know, like a story. And this is easy. This is like pretty easy. We watched it like some time ago. Let me just say what is the number of the of the movie. Uh, it was like seventy eight. So half halfway ago. Uh, could you just tell me what Blue Velvet was about? Of course. Uh, so Kyle MacLachlan plays a young college boy from a cute little town in middle America and he goes home because his father had an accident. He's in the hospital. Um, he meets a high school girl named Laura Dern that he's kind of interested in. She has a boyfriend. Yeah. And he also becomes interested in... Oh, I love her and I can't think of her name. Uh, I was going to say Isabel Cosette. No, it's Isabel Rosalini. Yes. Because she's a singer? Anyway, he, he becomes kind of this, this voyeur into her life and he sneaks into her apartment and then it turns out that she's basically being controlled by this super evil psycho that like sucks helium and makes her do sexual things. Baby! Baby wants to do sex with mama! Uh, I love that you have... Been, I forgot like half of the stuff that you just mentioned about like just going back to visit the father and everything. You didn't even mention that he found an ear in the middle of nowhere. That was going through my head, so that's the first like metaphor. He's walking through some grass, and under the beautiful grass is a severed ear that's covered in ants, and it's the first subtle hint from David Lynch that there might be an ugly underbelly to this cute little American town. And boy, does he show us that underbelly. Oh, yes, he does. How does he do? 
spoiler alert. That I honestly can't remember. I think that the police goes and detains like the guy harassing Isabella Rossellini while he's like hiding in the closets and about to be discovered. Yeah, and he takes her to her baby that <gasps> David oh, Lynch, sure. or not David Lynch, the bad guy, the died poor guy I liked him a lot, um, that was keeping from her and she thanks him and then he goes back to college, I guess, as if nothing happened. <laughs> No, like, and now we're happy forever after. Let's forget that I found that ear. Let's forget that I saw all of this. Let's forget that I actually had sex with Isabella Rossellini. You know, all of that. Uh, oh, man. Now I want to watch that movie. Yeah, that movie is, is good. It, that was like one of those, like, I didn't like it too much, like the first time that I watched it. And I didn't know this. This is a good movie. It's a bizarre movie. But before, when you were talking about like campiness, this movie has a bit of campiness, but only campiness because it takes it to the absurd, some of the stuff that it does. Yeah, like the, the criminal dens where there's just like these- The brothel, yeah. Naked women just sitting there smoking cigarettes. Yeah, that part is like, this looks like a comedy, let's be honest. Uh, but, is, yes, I remember Blue Velvet. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, but going back to uh, Cassé, I think that we should score it. This was your pick. I have to score it first. This is a hard one for me to score because I was expected to be super impacted by it. You know, like just being in shock for the two hours that it last. I was extremely entertained. I couldn't pull out my eyes away. And that's hard when you have like five minutes of recording that nothing happens multiple times, you know, in the movie. I could say that I'm going to be an eighth. You know, I think that doing this, albeit, is not the kind of message that I was expecting from a Haneke film, is masterfully done. Yeah, my Haneke score is done. also an eight. Um, I just, it's the competence that you see in this direction, it's just like, wow, you know how to tell a story. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I agree with you that, is that there are not so many directors that they can do this in such a classic way. Because I'm trying to think is that we can talk about other directors that like they can try to provoke something, like, I don't know, Gaspar Noé, for example. He's not as clinical. He's oh, no. more like a laboratory. Yeah, we're gonna put everyone on drugs and yeah. <laughs> and just use the camera in these crazy ways and put in super loud music. Is it it's cool. He has his resources, but Haneke, it feels like effortless. It feels like I don't need resources. I will let like reality just speak for it and make you feel bad for it. Because reality is horrific. Yep. God, I love him. I love him and I, it makes me terrified <laughs> that I love him. He's <laughs> like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Come on. So uh, this was your pick. So your second arrow pick, I guess. Yeah. So uh, for next one, I'm going to be regretting this. That's my feeling that I'm going to be regretting this. But I want us to watch a movie that we really disagreed when it came out like many years ago about like if it was good or not. So I want to keep the benefit of the doubt. I want to see if I, not I, but if the movie grew as a person. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel better about it. So, and the other day I was talking like randomly with someone and he told me that they were like from Detroit and I was saying, that, oh yeah, that's good for, you know, like destruction porn. Uh, you can see it in a lot of movies. And I think that the one that displayed that kind of, not really decadence, but a bit more of a, how do you say? The beauty of the crumbling former yeah. glory. For, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like just how this city like disappear almost in the blink of an eye, uh, that is Detroit, we're going to be watching Only Lovers Left Alive. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, let's see where we get. Uh, no, no, the, ca the, the, the cast is amazing. Visually, I remember that it's incredible. I remember that the music was pretty good too, like pretty good taste. Is it more than aesthetics exercise? We will talk about it in the switch. Tune in next week. <laughs> Sadly. And to all of that audience that we have there, like those five people, is that just stay warm if you are in Chicago. Or stay warm in San Francisco because it was in the 40s last week. 40s. Oh my God. 40s. That's crazy. 
<laughs> uh, should I do anything else? Wash your hands, guys. <laughs> and goes. Bye. <laughs>